It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 279 at block height 699,654. What is up, guys? <laughs> What's up, guys? I'm just laughing at our stupid governor. He just tweeted out something, and then he had to delete it because it just looks so stupid. Uh, Colorado is always the joke every now and again. So, But it's still a beautiful state, but it's that's what's going on over here. What's going on with you, user Janine? Good. Not much, man. Usual stressors. I'm full of salmon. Nice. I exist in a hell made of Docker. I told you Docker was a flaming pile of shit. <laughs> it's all Docker. All the way down. Well, yeah, it's been kind of a crazy week. I mean, talk about just ups and downs, things going on. I mean, you know, yesterday was the big El Salvador day, which we'll get to. But, I mean, early on, uh, we were looking at um, decentralized identity and how far along that project might go. And it looks like uh, the W3C made their way into the discussion. Yeah. So... Daniel Buckner from Microsoft, uh, who actually like pretty much designed <laughs> the DID protocol, uh, made a, a tweet last week, kind of just vaguely talking about companies in the Silicon Valley circle, like big tech companies, um, gearing up to come out very heavily against Bitcoin. Um, which is kind of a predominant attitude privately. Um, and he, he kind of just said, like, this is going to come out in the open now. Um, I think it was, like, literally the next day, uh, Mozilla, where he used to work, uh, published, because one thing to their credit, um, they actually do... Uh, publish their involvement in the w3c and their their stance on things uh publicly uh but they pretty much came out recommending torpedoing the entire did specification and went further to the point of saying that they will not support the approval of any kind of protocol api specification any any standard period that was built on a proof of work blockchain because of the energy consumption nonsense. And um, the W3C themselves uh, tweeted out shortly after pretty much trying to downplay this, that it is solely, uh, you know, the, the opinion and attitudes of Mozilla amongst the member organizations. But all the votes uh, on anything as far as specification being ratified are private. And like I said, Mozilla is really the only company involved in this that kind of comes outright publicly with their stance on things. So I take that with a massive grain of salt, trying to offload this onto just Mozilla as their sole opinion. Especially when you look at the fact that, I don't know, the Ethereum Foundation, um, Consensus, are all W3C members. Um, and a lot of the big tech companies like Google, like Facebook, are not very friendly to Bitcoin. Um, you know, many high-ranking Google employees have 
has said negative things about Bitcoin before. Facebook obviously is trying to still salvage uh, Libra in the form of Diem that it's called now. Um, all these companies really have kind of incentives to not go along with Bitcoin. They, they were all gearing up over the last 10, 20 years prior to and during Bitcoin's growth to try and replace banks. Like all, all of these big tech companies, they wanted to get into financial services. That's where Apple Pay, Google Pay came from. And so Bitcoin kind of jumping up out of nowhere, it kind of wrecks their plans in that regard, uh, unless they move in a direction working with Bitcoin, which is not the general way that these companies go. So uh, yeah, pretty much um, unless this really just is Mozilla and Mozilla alone, which I highly doubt. Um, DIDs, um, any kind of address resolution, um, any kind of API support for resolving or handling DIDs is probably never going to get into any of the major web browsers ever um, because of this. And if Mozilla's stance um, going to the point of fuck anything built on a proof of work blockchain period is indicative of the, the general attitude amongst member organizations, then it's probably going to be the case for pretty much anything based on Bitcoin. It's just not going to make it into these major web browsers. They won't support it. They will make it a giant pain in the ass to integrate anything into the web. And there's going to be massive amounts of friction trying to build seamless applications that are just intuitively easy to use because they just said fuck you you're not getting into the web browser Boo. it'll be interesting to see what the general general you know sentiment does come about to be um amongst the the corporate uh elite that ultimately matter in deciding this and I think you're right. These guys have wanted to be banks for a long time. Um, banks are where the money is, as they say. And if, if banks are as cheap and easy to host as a database and a giant compliance team, you know, in the modern day, the people that you log into would really just love to also be your bank account. So to some extent, anything that offers friction on that it doesn't make them money, makes it harder for them to comply with whatever's going on. And right now, the international stance, even from the IMF on down, is essentially, you know what, uh, we, we kind of, we're going to take a step back and say it's just a bad idea that you mess around and non, non paper, non our our general team's money non-nation state money and uh we're just gonna let you uh figure that out while we uh sit over here for a minute and the the general unknowing of the situation that surrounds custodying cryptocurrencies offering something like interest on cryptocurrencies these days uh how you might do things like custody that access control account for you know, prove all of these things are super duper up in the air. And it just sounds hard to anybody looking to be a bank or existing banks. So I'm, I'm disappointed to see standards committees weigh in perhaps on what should be acceptable as money. Um, if your standards committee isn't really around monetary stuff, I'm, I'm not quite sure why you would. Um, there's a reason that there's locales, you know, at the web browser and you can have money formatting and language formatting and just understanding of the world formatted by locale. And there's definitely a Bitcoin locale. It's here. Uh, it is a little queer and you're going to have to get used to us because we're not going anywhere. And the good thing is we've got nation states on our side at this point. I. I really liked the tweet that I saw this week where 
um, somebody referred to El Salvador as stacking sats. And I think Wiz came back and said, no, no, no. When it's a nation state, it's, it's called stacking coins. And it's true. And that's great. I love that a nation state will at least put a little pressure on Michael Saylor's Bitcoin buying game and all, everybody else who is now considering what is open, unrestricted, ultimately very hard to impose limitations around the use of and around what you want to do with your value. Um, the, the corollary between the W3C is a banking regulator that sits somewhere and is like, look, here's what banks get to do and not do. And this is the standard. And you get to comply with this if you would like the ability to summon money out of thin air as a bank. And, you know, most people really like that ability. So if that standard says, nope, you don't get to play whatever the game is, then you just don't. And you can lobby politically for a change in that standard, but that's kind of where you get to. And I, I refuse to accept this idea that the W3C actually defines the web to the point that they say, I can't use the web however I want with whatever currency I care for, adapting whatever data I want to ultimately push to somebody else that somebody else wants and what they want to give to me and how we want to use that. What happens when the W3C comes to the table and they're like, look, Bitcoins are out. We may actively try to discourage their use. Um, we're definitely not going to make it easy. Uh, I kind of remember the history of this. There's this little thing called, well, it was ultimately called Flash. Oh, my God. It was called Adobe Flash. And go the answer is you can bolt on to motherfucking web browsers. If the web browser doesn't want to natively support what people want, we will bolt on runtimes. Deal with it. Yeah, but that's like, see, like people who are competent and motivated, this isn't really going to change much. It's, it's going to be friction for people who aren't coming here unless you can put the thing in front of their hand where they just click and it's in the browser and oh that works and like yeah we can take advantage of a lot of inherent things that aren't going to change in a web browser like you can just drop a javascript app into something but i really don't want to have to push in that direction because that has serious security implications like where are you getting that that javascript blob from that has to be served somewhere or from somewhere like that that boils down to certificate authorities now being able to play games there um if they truly wanted to because you know that that code it's 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 a like a normie isn't gonna sideload something into a browser that's just not happening so that has to seamlessly be served from a trust or a trusted source so like trying to hack around this kind of stuff in that way that that has a lot of security implications to think through and remember like these big tech companies are kind of the ones that can pull those strings like that Oh yeah, they can definitely influence all this. And the good thing is, as far as browser additions go these days, for what you just described, you can easily encapsulate it into a browser extension and you can sign it. And it, it can be a known quanta. And yeah, people can fight against those two. You know, they might not be up publicly. There, there could be all sorts of things. This will surely be a, a long and hard fought war. What will be interesting is as the incentive for those that actually have some skin in the Bitcoin game goes up, you, you've got companies like Square that are clearly on their side. You've got individuals like Michael Saylor that are running pseudo ETFs because there's no ETF in this country. But then you have a lot of still talking skeptically, but willing to sell to the upper two and a half, five percent of people, high net worth clients bitcoins at a fee 
as soon as they have infrastructure for this, they're going to be all about this. There's not going to be any more, you know, Coinbase Lind problems that could happen. I don't know. It'll just be the banks doing business. It's like, let let me tell a story about uh, an old browser plugin that was built in this space. Um, Adam Gibson was involved in it. It was called TLS Notary. And pretty much what it did was allow you to seed um, manually through the browser API entropy in the TLS handshake. Um, and the whole point of it was you you would get the website you're loading first and then use that in the TLS handshake so that you effectively get a notarization from their certificate of the actual web content that they delivered. And the the goal in the end here for this was effectively to allow people to prove based on that signature and an open timestamp that this web authority served me this content around this rough time and cryptographically there's no fucking way to deny that. Um, the browsers just removed that API and broke the whole thing. Like that, that would have been a completely decentralized, cryptographically secured, undeniable web page archive. And they just broke it by changing the browser. Like they can just do the same thing with Bitcoin. I'm not saying they won't attack it. I'm saying we're going to keep using it. So don't be down. You know, we knew corporations, we knew governments, we probably could have assumed some standards bodies. You know, the the idea right now, I, I, I'm still trying to understand where somebody is trying to shape us around energy expenditure and its legitimacy or not. But, it you know, it got called some time ago. The, the primary FUD this cycle might be energy expenditure in a currency without doing any competitive accounting or any um, value of what you get, et cetera, accounting uh, before analyzing it and just pitching that to people yeah, well I'm it just definitely saying. sounds Sorry. like sounds like this whole w3c organization like you know they're it's a conglomerate of companies that are definitely working with to try and help actively develop what we know is just a couple of years out right the cbdc and some sort of like uh you know hand-me-down compliance set all the way through to them and i mean i'm just i, I mean like yeah they're just uh working in large stuff to try and make sure that's all together. But I mean, ultimately it just sucks for the decentralized identity project. Like I know you have talked a lot about it as far as like uh, having decentralized identifiers is really important because, you know, like uh, having, you know, free money and more working towards a more free net, you know, requires some uh, pretty hard identities too, but we'll see how that all develops. It literally is the biggest problem aside from fixing money, but yeah, I'm, I'm just saying like it's it, this is an uphill battle if these guys really dig in and, and do this. All right, well, we'll see how that develops. I mean, like uh, we'll keep our eye on both uh, the W3C and decentralized identity. Um, but uh, looks like Twitter is working with Lightning Network trying to do tips but it's not tipping up me it's some new beta project they're working on fill me in yeah so uh twitter is finally getting around to beta testing a lightning implementator integration um and they're starting off with a strike essentially um so people mm-hmm. will be able to link their strike accounts to receive lightning tips and if, if you really want to do this in a decentralized way i'm sorry that doesn't scale um there has been so much like backlash about this and and reading about it and i just have to say do you have a brain in your head if you thought that decentralized everybody has their own payment channel on chain integration into twitter could scale at this point in time 
Um, if the answer to that that question is yes, you do not have a brain in your head. Like that that whole idea is ridiculous. There is no way that a service the size of Twitter could integrate Bitcoin in any way except custodially. Bitcoin just doesn't scale that far yet. And like the integration with Strike is the this, this simplest no-brainer like solution. It's a pre-existing service that they can just integrate with because you know what would happen if Twitter tried to run that service themselves? Hey, guess what? They're a financial custodian then and have to comply with all the red tape and regulations that come along with that. So yeah, um, like th this is a, it's a pretty cool thing, but I I'm just amazed at how many people expected anything but this kind of integration at first. Like the, the best we can do to support non-custodial things is Bolt 12. Um, Rusty Russell from Blockstream's um, new Bolt proposal to have reusable lightning invoices. Um, well, not actually reusable invoices, but a static piece of information that could be used to contact a node directly and get invoices whenever you want to pay them. And like, yeah, we can we can just pop that in somewhere. And once that rolls out on the network and it actually becomes ratified in the spec, um, that's supported, it's compatible, but that still doesn't magically make Lightning or Bitcoin scalable enough for everybody to just plug into Twitter with their own Lightning channels. Interesting. I mean, like I thought I saw something about Strike and Twitter together. I, I, you know, things have been busy lately. It's been hard to keep up. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, pretty awesome. I mean, just somebody being able to tip some sats on Twitter. I mean, sounds like a good idea. I mean, like, you know, yeah, like you're saying, it's custodial because of the scale of Twitter. I mean, talk about a big user base and I mean, given everybody that potential. Um, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure there's going to be a way to uh, work to get those sats uh, into your custody if you'd like. We'll have to see. But I mean, um, you know, way that a uh, strike has been going with this development i would imagine that's the way it is we'll see sounds pretty cool jack and jack are about to get even more confusing <laughs> <laughs> right both like meta bitcoin guys uh yeah the two jacks well, yes. well yeah uh you want to just peel the band-aid real quick janine and let's yeah. get into this very disappointing news yeah, unfortunately, ProtonMail is in the news this week because they disclosed the IP address and device information of a French climate activist who also used their email service um, to Europol in response to, quote, a legally binding order from the Swiss authorities, which we are obligated to comply with. And that activist was recently arrested by French authorities, as they state on their transparency report page, ProtonMail says they comply with two types of orders, one, orders from the Swiss authorities, and two, foreign requests that have been duly instructed and validated by Swiss authorities through an international legal assistance procedure and determined to be in compliance with Swiss law. Also, in addition to the items listed in our privacy policy in extreme criminal cases, ProtonMail may also be obligated to monitor the IP addresses which are being used to access the ProtonMail accounts, which are engaged in criminal activities. Whether or not a case qualifies for these enhanced obligations is determined solely by Swiss authorities and not by ProtonMail. Under no circumstances will ProtonMail be able to provide the contents of end-to-end -end encrypted messages sent to ProtonMail. Um, regarding this incident, Andy Yen tweeted, In this particular case, the suspect unfortunately did break Swiss law and there was simply no possibility to the decision. Did I die or did Janine die? I think Ambu she did. Ambulance. Oh, the ambulance. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, so he says, In this particular case, the suspect unfortunately did break Swiss law, and there was simply no possibility to fight the decision made by the Swiss Federal Department of Justice. Um, in a blog post they published on the subject, also he wrote, We will clarify that the use of our Onion site details was highly recommended for users with heightened privacy needs. So, again, this does not surprise me because... Um, 
you know, we talk about custodial Bitcoin, email, a lot of email clients uh, running on other people's infrastructure. They have your emails just because they're encrypted doesn't mean that you're completely safe um, because there's also metadata. There's things like how do you access where the email is hosted? Uh, what device did you use to do that? This is the kind of information that services collect. Now, one moment. Other people. Okay, yeah, so as I was saying, this does not surprise me because um, I have heard previous instances of them responding to warrants. Um, I think at some point you said that they get 700 or more a year quests for information, and they do fight them. They don't just comply with everything, but the, at the end of the day, they are still a known uh, company that does an email service, and Swiss law is not perfect. Um, it has a lot of advantages over a lot of other countries in terms of privacy protection, but um, it is not perfect. Um, so yes, when the state says they have to give data, um, some of which apparently they will change their policy to acquire, which includes locking IP addresses and device information, um, yeah, that is going to happen. And luckily there are ways to prevent that, um, if you are using ProtonMail to prevent that personal information, if where or not it's being logged from being shared with them at all which is to use VPNs, use Tor, use, there's some uh, like browser extensions that actually change the device identifier or device features that are also shared. So you can, for example, pretend to be a mobile device, even though you're using a laptop or pretending to use a different browser profile, etc. So these are things that you can protect against. Obviously it sucks that, uh, that they can just change their policy of not logging to logging when the authorities demand it, but that is what you're going to get when you have a popular email service like this. Um, it applies to every email service that you use. Um, the point of this email service is not to be completely impervious to the state. They're not trying to do that, They're trying to just encrypt people's email so that you get something that is at least not Google. Um, cause I, I guarantee you Google is complying with a lot more shit than ProtonMail is. So at the end of the day, this doesn't really upset me because my threat model for ProtonMail is that it's not Google. Um, I use a ton of other things for talking to people that's not email if I really consider it sensitive and if I want to prevent them from getting my IP address or device information, then I can just use other tools to mask that. So yes. Trusted third parties are security holes. Nick Zabo. All right. So Proton Mail is doing what they can, but I mean, if you really need it, like do Proton Mail through Onion and Tor and all that stuff just to make sure, because yeah, I mean, there's lots of data leaks, and you know, if that stuff's out there and it gets pushed down hard enough, uh, probably go towards the state. So, speaking of, well, leaks or, I guess, uh, Apple's attempt to just make leaks the norm, what, uh, what happened with their rollout of this uh, scanning thing? Uh, well, in episode 276, we talked about Apple's proposed uh, CASM uh, scanning tool that would be, quote, continuously monitoring photos saved or shared on the user's iPhone, iPad, or Mac. One system detects if a certain number of objectionable photos is detected in iCloud storage and alerts the authorities. Another notifies the child's parents if iMessage is used to send or receive photos that a machine learning algorithm considers to contain nudity. Well, this month, they decided to delay that rollout, citing feedback from customers and policy groups, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation and American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU. On October, or no, on August 5th, the EFF had written, it's impossible to build a client side scanning system that can only be used for sexually explicit images sent or received by children. As a consequence, even a well-intentioned effort to build such a system will break key promises of the messenger's encryption itself and open the door to broader abuses. Uh, as 
All it would take to widen the narrow back door that Apple is building is an expansion of the machine learning parameters to look for additional types of content or a tweak of the configuration flags to scan not just for children's or but anyone's accounts. That's not a slippery soap, that's a fully built system just waiting for external pressure to make the slightest change. And this is exactly what I said um, was the reason why I brought it up as a story because in the future I thought it was entirely, it would be entirely possible for them to start start scanning for uh, Bitcoin or crypto related content uh, terms in order, for example, maybe the IRS telling them that they want to check for tax evasion or something like that. They could easily come up with some kind of very poorly uh, supported position uh, for why they should do that, which is what they did with this tool. Um, because, I mean, besides tons of people tearing apart why it wouldn't work, um, yes, it can also be expanded into other areas besides CSAM. Um, so yeah, Apple's statement, I will scroll one second. Uh, Apple's statement to TechCrunch says, quote, Last month we announced plans for features intended to help protect children from predators who use communication tools to recruit and exploit them and limit the spread of CSAM. Based on feedback from customers, advocacy groups, researchers, and others, we have decided to take additional time over the coming months to collect put and make improvements before releasing these critically important child safety features. So they have not killed it. Um, they just said they're going to improve it, and who knows how long that will take and whether they will actually improve it or not in any substantial fashion. Well, it's good to hear that they're not rolling that out in the electronic whatever the EFF actually uh you know said something that was um you know helpful for this I, it's just a stupid thing that they can even think they could do this like uh prevent that measure and like I don't know it's just a lot more of this whole platform policing and it's scary where it's going I'm glad they backed off hopefully they'll stay off so guess just real quick uh but yeah so Gary Gensler and the SEC are uh, putting Uniswap in their crosshairs and uh, starting to get a little, little fed up with uh, the DeFi games and skirting around, uh, you know, KYC and regulations. Yeah, it appears that way. I, um, I've seen quite a bunch about the SEC coming after different uh, token systems. So yeah, they're coming after Uniswap, huh? CC. You know, I just knew whenever Shapeshift went to that, like, uh, you know, Uniswap, like, we're just going to make our company into a token system. Like, I just knew. I was like, man, they're just shining a regulator's light on, you know, something so that they can come at it. And um, here it is. I mean, it's the same thing as the original ICO frenzy, man. Like, everybody thought they got away with shit because the SEC didn't come immediately knocking on their door. And then a couple years later. Yep. Well, we're going to have another corollary on this one to come. It's just, uh, you know, traditional markets looking at this definitely see a competitor. And of course, the SEC sees something it needs to have a hand in regulating. Yep. All right. It's the constant battle for the regulator to find their way in. And I guess they're in. So the big news today came from a thread by uh, one of our favorite punching bags, Brian Armstrong. But it sounds like some serious news. So let's uh, dig into this pretty lengthy thread. So I'll read this. Brian says, quote, Some real sketchy behavior coming out of the SEC recently. Story time. Millions of crypto holders have been earning yield on their assets over the last few years. It makes sense if you want to lend out your funds, you can earn a return. Everyone seems happy. A bunch of great companies in crypto have been offering versions of this for years. Coinbase came out recently and said we would be launching our own version. We were planning to go live in a few weeks, so we reached out to the SEC to give them a friendly heads up and briefing. They responded by telling us this lend feature is a security Okay, seems strange. How can lending be a security? So we asked the SEC to help us understand and share their view. We always make an effort to work proactively with regulators and keep an open mind. 
They refuse to tell us why they think it's a security and instead subpoena a bunch of records from us. We comply, of course. Demand testimony from our employees. We comply, of course. And then tell us they will be suing us if we proceed to launch with zero explanations as to why. Look, we're committed to following the law. Sometimes the law is unclear, so the SEC wants to publish guidance. We are also happy to follow that. It's nice if you actually enforce it evenly across the industry equally, by the way. But in this case, they are refusing to offer any opinion in writing to the industry on what should be allowed and why, and instead, of, and, and, and instead are engaging in intimidation tactics behind closed doors. Whatever their theory is here, it feels like a reach land grab versus other regulators. Meanwhile, plenty of other crypto companies continue to offer a lend feature, but Coinbase is somehow not allowed to. Gensler, in his confirmation hearing, said, quote, it's important for the SEC to provide guidance and clarity, close quote. Our here, Geiser said, quote, sometimes there's a clarity that will be a thumbs up, but even if it's a thumbs down, it's important to provide that. And that's what Ginzer said. Brian continues, if you don't want this activity, then simply publish your position in writing and enforce it evenly across the industry. Ostensibly, the SEC's goal is to protect investors and create fair markets. So who are they protecting here, and where is the harm? People seem pretty happy to earn yield on these various products across lots of other crypto companies. Shutting these down would arguably be harming consumers more than protecting them. And by preventing Coinbase from launching the same thing that other companies already have live, they are creating an unfair market. In May of this year, I traveled to D.C. to meet with every regulator and branch of government I could. The SEC was the only regulator that refused to meet with me, saying, quote, we're not meeting with any crypto companies. This that this was right after we became the first crypto company to go public in the U.S. Gensler has been confirmed just a month prior, so I brushed it all off as the SEC is still getting its feet under it. Now I'm not so sure. We've always tried to be good actors in the space, <laughs> leaning into sensible regulation even when it is difficult or expensive. We try to think about what products we would want for ourselves and what risk we would want for our families to be aware of before launching products. We will keep following this approach, yet here we are being threatened with legal action before a single bit of actual guidance has been given to the industry of these, on these products. If we end up in court, we may finally get the regulatory clarity the SEC refuses to provide, but regulation by litigation should be the last resort for the SEC, not the first. Our door remains open. Hopefully the SEC steps up to create the clarity this industry deserves without harming consumers and companies in the process. America could really use all us all working together to figure this out right now. Close quote by Mr. Armstrong. Now, that's definitely uh, some funny bits in there, but there's been some interesting commentary to build our discussion here. Jerry Brito from Coin Center says, quote, if true, this is pretty underhanded. I know it's easy for me to say, but Coinbase should go ahead and launch its product. Let the SEC sue and go to court. Let the SEC make its case and let a judge decide whether the law, what the law is. Coinbase should go to court because the alternative is that the SEC will enforce against a small provider, settle with them out of court, and hold the scalp as guidance. Enough with guidance. Howie and Reeves are judge-made judge, judge -made laws. We need court decisions to get clarity here, close quote. And uh, then the ever-smart, famous Francis Coppola tells us this is a security because, quote, <laughs> the U.S. securities law exists to ensure that anything that looks like a time deposit but is issued by an entity that doesn't have a banking license is regulated as a security, close quote. So it's definitely an interesting time for the SEC making moves at this point. I mean, it just uh, seems weird since we've been seeing like a lot of DeFi stuff for a while now. But, um, you know, now Coinbase is IPO. They're publicly traded. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we'll see how this goes, but it looks like uh, it's setting up to be a court case. Yeah. Arms, Armstrong doing some strong arming. <laughs> right. I was actually not aware until yesterday that the banking license is the the sole differentiator between like lending products being securities or not. Like that kind of casts what BlockFi is dealing with in New Jersey in a whole different light. Right. 
I mean, it's, <laughs> it will be interesting once Kraken Bank and once uh, a a a who else is up there? Avanti. Yeah, Avanti. Uh, once they actually get licenses, should they to connect to the Fed system, they will be able to offer products like this. Evidently, right? Maybe. I mean, if this is if she's right, I mean, like if that's the case, then yeah, I guess that would probably get them to where they could do it. And um, yeah, I mean, this could just be a case where Coinbase is finally in a corner, and uh, there's not really anywhere to go other than the court. This seems like very selective enforcement. So mm -hmm. I, I'm interested in people who are saying that this is naturally a security when BlockFi, which has something like 10 billion AUM assets under management over there, is not a small entity, has been around for a few years now, and they could have talk to them in similar manner. Uh, there's also Abra. Uh, there's probably a handful of other American ones, and certainly there's a bunch of international ones. And uh, it's something that has been an industry that's been growing uh, and you know lucrative. Uh, BlockFi talks about how their older members, uh, say boomer age members, have typically held stable coins there. Uh, simply because they're interested in high yield on what are seen as stable U.S. dollars. So it's, it's interesting to me, the selective persecution of Coinbase. And I, I have to sit here and speculate you know, and wonder about who wants to slow down Coinbase and what political advantage there is to muddying the waters around this particular topic um, to give perhaps banks time to catch up and come play in this market. And Coinbase definitely represents the largest cryptocurrency exchange until FTX eats the entire world anyway. So they're out there looking like the biggest, longest lasting, most reputable bank to everybody. And, uh, you know, the potential of them offering this means lots of, again, perhaps older customers that hadn't yet may end up getting Coinbase accounts because they want yield on USDC. Oh, what happens now that you have a Coinbase account? Oh my gosh, you can get in all this crazy stuff. So I, I think there's, there's some pushback here that could perhaps be associated with those things. When you look at other companies like say FTX, which offers an interest rate product just like this and is allowed to. Yep. Definitely selective enforcement. And I mean, it is curious as to like, why now? And I mean, yeah, maybe it is just to play catch up. But um, it is pretty interesting just to see Coinbase be so cozy with all these regulators and then finally find themselves in a spot where they're not so cozy. And, you know, getting your best, uh, you know, coin center saying like, you should just go to court and let the judges decide, which that sounds kind of stupid to me, because it's like, if you go to court, and like a judge puts down a ruling that's going to be pretty devastating to your whole business model and like a lot of uh, of these networks. I could imagine like it kind of being one of those crypto disasters we were always talking about the externality that Ethereum is always creating. I think the SEC is trying to manufacture a problem here. And I would say that because Coinbase asked for writing on what they could and could not do an official opinion and it kind of sounds like that was not forthcoming and that's been the problem with regulating this industry for a lot of it and one of the rare exceptions to that was when we saw the occ letter uh several years ago with brian brooks at the helm that said look this is how we view some of this from for banking purposes because people have been asking and they finally laid it down and it kind of sounds like Coinbase asked for similar similar regulation on what they could and could not do here, or not regulation, even an opinion letter, something that they could receive and then cut apart legally and say, okay, we're going to meet all the points of this and then we can ship product. And they didn't get one. And industries need such things to succeed, especially when they're in muddy water, say. Anyway, Gensler, step up, man. Gensler, if, if you're going to talk about how almost everything on exchanges is shit 
and is a security and whatever, like, yes, you do have the ability to kill off a whole lot of market out there. You, you could do this in two minutes on national television. It would be very easy. And I'm, I'm not quite sure whether you're gearing up to do that or whether you kind of want to pussyfoot around and you've got something else to do. And it may well just be that he's got an offer that Coinbase is going to have a very hard time refusing. Mm-hmm. Honestly, my read is just like one probably not the best idea for the regulators to make public statements that effectively amount to market manipulation. Um, but also I'm betting the SEC is just taking their time because they probably don't want to try and take something to court and then have that blow up in their face. They want to, you know, dot all the I's, cross all the T's and make sure that things go the way they want. I think that's a very sober read. Yeah, they want a slam dunk case. And I guess maybe they feel like they have that on this one. And uh, if Coppola's right, I guess so. I I think she is. Like Preston Byrne um, was saying the same stuff. And uh, yeah, he is generally on point uh, as a American lawyer with uh, his take on things. All right. Well... Let's uh, see how it develops. I'm sure Coinbase will probably back off of that because, like they say, we comply. I always thought this BlockFi interest smelled kind of funny. Smells like securities. Yeah. You know, Bitcoin has that fresh smell. (laughs) Insecurities. All right, well, what's going on with, speaking of FTX taking over the world, what's, uh, what happened with their whole NFT or, or what's going on with this? Okay, I am not here to cover FTX and NFTs. Uh, I can <laughs> cover a little bit of them taking over the world. I wasn't even going to cover that. But one little part of them taking over the world, which by now is apparent, look around people, is if is uh, them supposedly buying Ledger X. So Forbes dropped a story that says uh, Mr. Bankman Freed and uh, Ledger X has agreed that they will get sold to FTX. There's no price. There's no hard date. Uh, Ledger X is special for being the uh, one spot that Americans can, uh, well, most Americans like you and I can go do Bitcoin options and futures, and they're fully physically backed. They've been around for a little bit. Um, you know, they, they are kind of the place to go do that again for regulatory reasons. And they, they exist as they exist for regulatory reasons. They don't have things like ACH transfers, but you can wire them money. Um, they don't deal in stable coins. You know, it's very explicitly dollars and et cetera, et cetera. But anyway, FTX has bought them. FTX internationally, I believe, is a major derivatives mark for Bitcoin. Uh, so this is FTX saying, guess what? We are here and ready to play in the U.S. market. Uh, there are noises in that story about them integrating that into an FTX product at some point. So very interesting. Um yeah, it, it puts them in a space where they don't have a lot of competitors in the United States. Yeah, I mean, uh, I remember, uh, yeah, this uh, looks good. Yeah, FTX buying Ledger X. They can do the futures now for Americans. Joke's on them. Americans don't believe in the future. <laughs> <laughs> right. I guess... Uh, it's you up next, Janine. Yeah, another FTX thing. Um, they announced on September 6th that you could now submit your own uh, NFT to be listed on their platform. Uh, and the announcement <laughs> linked to uh, an example NFT that was being offered for apparently a price of $270,000. And the NFT was the word test. Uh, crudely written in some kind of paint program. Yeah. Um, as expected by anyone with a brain, within a few hours, the CEO tweeted, Due to the massive number of submissions, too many of which were just a picture of a fish, 
We are now charging a one-time $500 fee to submit NFTs. Hopefully this will reduce spam. Um, and of course, this made all the artistic cheapers very mad because, oh my god, I have to offer $500 up front in order to put my digital artistic masterpiece on the market? Fuck you! So, within a few hours after that, the FTX CEO tweeted again, Now it costs a flat $10 per NFT to mint them. No upfront cost. We're refunding all the $500 on uh, all the $500 paid. Hopefully this reduces fish related spam while also making it affordable. <laughs> NFTs have a price floor, people. Right? That's what I'm thinking. It's like this sounds like a NFT like piece. Like, oh, NFTs are so hyped. Like we gotta charge this much money. All right, well, we're just gonna take that off and it's gonna be a lot lower now. And here come the NFTs and they got a floor price. Imagine that Ethereum was getting spammed with fish. <laughs> Listen, people, go forth, multiply your artistic ideas, impressions of the world, and become rich. Become rich on your cheap MS Paint text. Best yet, uh, spruce up the metaverse. Everyone benefits. Oh, my lord. Well, I've got to. Uh catch up on nfts and just understand where that world lies because it is just an insanity it's almost like look i mean i remember 2017 the ico stuff i mean it does feel very similar as far as just like the noise factor it's crazy so do you want to hear a very sad nft story that i saw on reddit yes i'd love it i think it Um, was on i don't follow subreddits too much but it was on that subreddit about like relationships and am i the asshole and this person wrote i think this the gist of the story was that they had traded dogecoin lost money on that and their girlfriend was upset and then this guy decided to propose to her and did not get a ring instead he offered an nft as (laughs) uh in his proposal and she was not enthusiastic about that let's say did he propose in like a video game or something what the hell <laughs> I, I i i believe the way he described it was that he showed the nft on his phone or something and said that he had it and that it was going to be worth a lot more in the future well he just needs to and bring... she should be happy he needs to find uh the right nft girl for him i guess that is funny, but uh, yeah, we can laugh about NFTs. Let's get into some serious news. Like, uh, well, towards the end of this, like, uh, first let's talk about some of the stuff going on around before El Salvador's launch. This time of recording this that happened yesterday, but a few things happened before that. Let's go into that first. So, all right. So uh, yesterday was September seventh, the day El Salvador's Bitcoin law went into effect. Now, like most political moves, there was some pushback. And protest against the new Bitcoin law. One of the activists was arrested at the protest named Mario Gomez. He was ordered to come with the uh, with PNC officials with no warrant under the threat of being handcuffed. So he went with the PNC. This caused an uproar on Twitter because for sure cyber hornets are going to swarm around anything shady from a dictator who's about to use Bitcoin on his whole population. Um, people are notably and rightfully upset with the way Bitcoin was being implemented there. And so they, you know, formed this protest. But uh, yeah, so the publication El Faro released a thread saying IT expert, quote, IT expert Mario Gomez, a vocal critic of the, you know, I still don't know how to say this last, this guy's last name. I'm so sorry. Buco? How, how do you say it? A vocal critic of the Buco administration Bitcoin project. Um, was briefly detained this morning by the National Civic Police for an alleged email phishing scam. His attorney says he has been released. Gomez's mother reported that the officers presented no warrant when they stopped him in his car and told him that if he did not come along, he would be handcuffed. Gomez then told the press that he was unaware of why he was being detained. The National Civil Police, the PNC, claimed that they detained Gomez while investigating financial fraud related to an email phishing scam. By law, only the attorney general has the authority to intercept communications and make arrests, except in, quote, flagrant cases. 
A press, a press officer from the Attorney General's officer told El Faro, quote, they tell me it's a move by the National Civil Police. Our office has no information at this time, close quote. So there we have it. I mean, uh, whatever happened with uh, whatever happened, the guy was arrested and released within the same day. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something that definitely kicked off on Twitter. And I know a bunch of people uh, might have wondered what happened. So uh, apparently it all had to do with some email phishing scam and he was released and he's scheduled to go to court. Now, we uh, also have um, in the show notes this opinion piece from Jerry Brito where he said, quote, New public opinion survey from top university in El Salvador. 99% of Salvadorians say Bitcoin use should be voluntary. 65% say not interested in downloading Shiva wallet. 70% think Bitcoin law should be repealed. Close quote. And then uh, he has linked to the poll, which was conducted by Instituto Universitario de Opinion Publica. Now, I've done a little digging, and this is all just really my opinion, but this all seems like flack coming from the IMF. I mean, first, the guy who was attending the No Bitcoin protest who got detained labels himself as a, quote, soy cat, who's working with this group called Resistencia Activia. And if you look at their feed, they are mainly pushing feminist ideology along with environmental activism. I mean, it might be somewhat organic, but I don't know. My Bitcoin senses are telling me this is a little political organization. is similar to many others who uh, international bank bankers have used to control these countries for decades. I mean, it could just be they're upset about Bitcoin and they think it's going to destroy the environment. I don't know, but it could just be the IMF, and uh, you know, pushing some stuff. I don't think Coin Center is being too honest in their discussion about the topic. They're working with, uh, you know, ETH heads and shit coiners to try and create a, the central bank CBDC dream. So, I don't know. That's my input. I know everyone wants to superimpose their life into El Salvador and say that this, that, or the other. The fact is, this is a voluntary network. And if a president of a country wants to push it onto his citizens, there's not much anyone can do about that. All I can say is you better stop wasting your time arguing with others how to govern their country and start educating your local leaders about how you think Bitcoin should be implemented in your economy. So, yeah, that's, uh, you know, kind of where I stand on it. But I mean, like, you know, a couple of bad things, you know, people saying, hey, you know, El Salvador doesn't want this. And, you know, 75, 70 percent of people, they say that the law should be repealed and, you know, of Understandably, I guess, like, you know, people are weary of people just getting arrested on the streets because they're protesting Bitcoin. I mean, it looks like all eyes are on this laser focused with magnifying glasses, and it just doesn't look like that many people are being earnest in the discussion about how the IMF has controlled protest groups and anti, you know, anti political movements for decades, centuries. I mean, man, no matter how much you talk about that which I agree or look at that study and think that it was rigged. Like they can only juke studies so much. Like even if those numbers are completely exaggerated, realistically, that's still a massive percentage of people in the country who feel that way. And it's like, this has been the whole point I've been making since like the first couple days after this was announced. Like, mandating the acceptance of Bitcoin was absolutely idiotic. Like that's literally like the one part of this bill that is going to cause so many problems. Like that never should have been uh, an article in this bill. I would agree. And I just think that's where, you know, we should be doing our part to educate people around us as to how exactly this should go about, because I mean, it's not our choice really what goes on over there yeah yeah i'm honestly not quite sure the right way to say it what or the right way to attack this one whether it would have been them saying you know we have this api essentially we have these rails and everybody has to use those rails um in addition to you know, any other way they want to pay for things, they have to accept those rails as opposed to explicitly Bitcoin. I don't know yet. I think time will tell around this, and it's going to be interesting to see other South American countries. Hopefully, 
um, respond to this, hopefully positively. But you know, I I would like to understand what what part of it um, generates a lot of the negative sentiment around the law, because uh, it it seems like they must not be framing something very well if there is substantial negative sentiment. Um, you know, it it was certainly painted to the West as even the stable coin rails before you get to Bitcoin would be very handy for people. So I I just, let's get some boots on the ground. Bitpaint, I nominate you. You're going to El Salvador, <laughs> buddy. Get your gear ready. You're dropping it 0800. Pack the shoot. I mean, I'm, you know, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with this uh, development, but I think the boil it down like thing that I saw on Twitter, somebody post like uh, woke Bitcoin is legal tender, bespoke, legal, no legal tender, like ban legal tender. There's no such thing as legal tender where, I mean, I don't know. I just think that's kind of like, it's really hard to say that that's the direction you can take as like a Central American country that hasn't really had any banking system to just, oh, we're going to just, we're going to go back to barter trade. Yeah, what's the, what's the situation where it's an optional legal tender? I don't know. Yeah, you got, I don't know, but people on Twitter seem to think that's an option. <laughs> I don't even know what it means. It, I, I think the core of it is, can you write contracts in it? Can you write legally enforceable contracts denominated in it as essentially the unit of account? I don't know. All right. Well, let's get into, I guess, some, uh, some of the better you know, news about this El Salvador news that's happened this week. Well, hold up. I just pulled up my notes in a couple of different places. Okay. So uh, on the other side of the coin, ahead of this uh, Bitcoin legal tender day, the El Salvadorian government set up a $150 million Bitcoin, $150 million Bitcoin trust. President of the Legislative Assembly, Ernest Castro, said, quote, We are heading towards a financial transformation, which has economic freedom and the collective growth of Salvadorians as its main purpose. And... Uh, Close quote. And there's a link to in the show notes to the video where it shows the assembly passing the measure to a roaring ovation of applause. I mean, it does look state produced because, yeah, it is. I mean, it's the equivalent of C-SPAN in El Salvador with a bunch of politicians who understand the importance of optics. This is definitely a political movement, which who's making use of this voluntary payments network. However, I'll say it appears like uh, most of these politicians are in the younger generation and have been you know, birthed into a failing country. So, I mean, with its reliance on unsound monetary policy as one of its chief inhibitors of self... What? Hold up. I'm sorry. My notes went kind of sideways here. Anyway. Um, yeah. I hope this trust, along with the legal tender law, will allow the growth of this nation, a growth that wouldn't have been found or seen without Bitcoin. I mean, however you feel about it, it's still an amazing story now, I know people have been uh, buying $30 in sats to support El Salvadorian's move. Um, you know, there's been a lot of that sort of stuff going on. Anyway, there's uh, there's now an El Salvadorian Bitcoin trust. And, um, you know, I saw the other day on Twitter also the president was saying that, you know, they bought the dip. They bought 200 coins, which, of course, like the day that this law went into effect yesterday, um, the Bitcoin price took a $10,000 candle to the negative. And, you know, that's just, uh, everybody knows when you buy the dip, it, it does that. It dips even harder. You got to buy harder. Yeah. Bitcoiners need to learn to be careful what they wish for. <clears throat> 10K candle. 10K candle backwards. So, yeah, now they've got this trust. So they've got a large holdings and like you were saying they're starting to stack coins and uh you know try to accrue some wealth for their nation and uh try and help build themselves up which um you know i think that's a good thing i know that you know there's a lot of controversy about you know the way it's implemented and that's where i think it just you know we should be working to make sure that you know these sort of things are not uh forced but i mean it's just, uh, I mean, like the way I see it is in a couple of years, we're all going to be forced onto some network that's probably going to be CBDC, you know, controlled. But 
Anyway, like uh, people are buying Big, McDon Big Macs and Starbucks coffees all with the Lightning Network. And, you know, I saw McDonald's has got open node. So, I mean, there's some good stuff. Apparently, Walmart's not using it. I, I don't know. Like I saw something where somebody went to try and buy some uh, buy something at Walmart with Bitcoin. and It didn't work out. But maybe that was, you know, and this is where the whole legal tender thing happens. Well, now Walmart as a company, they say like we don't want to accept Bitcoin. Well, now El Salvadorian's government can like sue them. And be like, no, you have to accept Bitcoin. I, I don't know. I mean, we're just going to see how this thing shakes out. Uh, one thing I am bullish on is companies like the McDonald's and the Starbucks and maybe not the Walmarts go into some of these outside vendors and solving the problem of how to accept Bitcoin because they're going to have the solution on the shelf as they either want to use it or who knows, maybe they'll be compelled to use it elsewhere. Yeah, it is kind of a little hysterical watching um, Starbucks take Bitcoin and imagining Roger Beer shrieking at a wall as his head explodes. All right. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah um, rollout, though, was not without its hitches and problems, though. Um, yeah, well... There was like some craziness with the Shiva wallet has got people's names like to direct, direct, yeah. directly into it. The uh, Every time a user generates a lightning invoice, their full legal name is encoded in the invoice. And like I know I've said multiple times on the show that, you know, this rollout will have problems, um, you know kind of step back cut some slack and think about things because nothing at this scale has ever been done before but i mean like holy fucking shit like you can't use a fucking account number some other kind of identifier like you just dox every user's name in the invoice like come on man even in a incredibly rushed deployment, like the dev team that did that, that made that decision, it's like, what the fuck, man? This is definitely why I'm long security audits in this space. Yeah. Yeah, I'd yeah. imagine that's a, uh, I mean, you know, it's bad, but I mean, like, uh, you don't have to use this Chiva wallet, right? Like, I mean, I've seen people are just using Wallet of Satoshi and Strike, which, I mean, like, there's not this uh, same problem. No, you yeah, don't I... have to, but to collect the free $30 of Bitcoin, you do. <laughs> and also remember, like, a key part of Chivo is it will work on their cell networks, even if you don't have, like, a data plan. So, like, it's it's free to use without having to pay for cell service. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, though, you were going to say something, Jimmy? I just want to say BitGo, you know? What's up with BitGo? BitGo is the partner behind this wallet. You didn't see that? <laughs> no, I didn't. Where, oh, when, yeah. and Mike where is that Mike Belshi getting Mike Belshi getting quoted and everything? I can go get it. <sighs> yeah. Well, should I should I hit Nigeria pretty quick here? Let Let me do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so in, in other news, while uh, Janine preps, uh, the Central Bank of Nigeria uh, on the 30th of August announced that they have a partner for their grand, I'm sorry, project giant, as the Nigerian CBDC pilot is known, straight out of their press release. Uh, they've got somebody from Barbados to partner with here to produce uh, 
their CBDC or get started on it. I, I don't have the right characterization of where we're going. Uh, in, in other news, another CBDC news, uh, on September 2nd, news came out that Australia, Singapore, Malaysia, and South Africa uh, have a joint initiative called Project Dunbar to trial international settlement using CBDCs. So, these guys are all spinning up their PayPal databases and uh, evidently now releasing press releases, which have got to be cheap to release. So uh, enjoy. That is your uh, CBDC update. <gasps> Jeez. Australia. I feel so sorry for Australia. Oh, man. Yes. My Aussie friends, I would come there to save you if I could. More economic blocks. Those have always gone well in history, right, bud? Oh, it's it's good stuff. Uh, I think it's fun the way these guys are kind of segmenting up to do it. And we used to have uh, um, acronyms like bricks and pigs and like whoever else we want to group together. So it, it'll be fun to see if this develops into actual trade network stuff. I definitely would not give it that high of a nod. I think these are more like tiers of countries around the G8 or whatever. And, you know, they're practicing together. They're getting their tech people together. They're going to solve a big problem, host a database. They might even encrypt it. Good time had by all. You can write headlines about how modern you are as you wait for Bitcoin to take over the world. Who's ready for Bitcoin? Done. Uh, right. So in a Forbes article published on September 7th, uh, titled El Salvador Taps Billionaire-Backed Bitcoin Unicorn and Historic Legal Tender Debut, says for uh, for months El Salvador has kept many of Chivo's details under wraps with the nation's 40 year old president teasing the wallet's launch on Twitter just last week. However, Forbes has learned El Salvador appears to have tapped cryptocurrency unicorn BitGo to provide uh, Chivo's wallet infrastructure and security platform, making the Palo Alto, California based startup the nation's exclusive hot wallet provider in a historic moment for cryptocurrency adoption. Digital assets look so different from what we've seen with other types of money, and so people wonder how they fit in. But this is an opportunity to build financial freedom for the people of El Salvador, says BitGo CEO Mike Belshi, speaking from his home in Silicon Valley on Saturday. The ability to send money in a hurry on a Saturday night when banks are closed across the planet and at almost no fees, it's hard to put into words how empowering that is and what we'll see in El Salvador is. Uh, people will start figuring it out. What? That's crazy. So if you want somebody to blame, BitGo. Belchie. Yeah. I didn't even know he had a lightning wallet. Like, I mean, I, I thought BitGo was mainly just main chain. Well, I guess this was their honest attempt at one. <laughs> <laughs> what Put, a ridiculous shit show. Putting people's names in the invoices. That just seems like I wonder if like really the development with the administration was kind of going for that. I mean, like putting everybody on rails to where it's like, yeah, you get thirty dollars of free Bitcoin and this is like the free network that you got to use. And I mean, that does seem pretty uh, shady. And um, I hope, you know, with Bitcoin's uh, ability to develop, people can uh, build a wallet that's better that uh, somehow still operates with that. Makes I you mean, wonder what other things they could have fucked up. I mean, the government is going to get that info regardless, and that's always been an aspect of this. But, like, you don't have to dox that to literally everybody you receive money from. Like, that. that's just, like, yeah, somebody thinking through user identification when this got built out is a fucking idiot. Yeah, this just goes against, uh, you know, I mean, it goes against a lot of like the way that uh, <laughs> Bitcoin development should. I mean, it seems like a pretty obvious what the hell. So um, hopefully there's a lot of pushback on this and that will get resolved. Uh, I mean, because, um, you know, I'd imagine if 
these people, it's like, you know, this administration thinks that these people have a right to uh, free money. And I would hope they think they'd have a right to like uh, other things. But, you know, it's politics. Californication. All right. We ready for the next thing? And then we're going to have to reorganize the news desk because Fudd's a dick who just went AFK when his thing is the next thing after the next thing. Huh? Huh? We'll do some some raz jazzmatazz with the news desk. Yeah, so what's going on with the uh, the cold card update? The latest version of cold card firmware is something I've been waiting for for fucking years. They have integrated support for output descriptors and the import descriptors function in Bitcoin Core so that you can build a descriptor-based wallet file and directly use the cold card with PSBTs directly with Bitcoin Core. I can finally actually use the Bitcoin Core wallet, which is like one of the only wallets in this entire ecosystem that I have never fucking used because I refuse to put my keys on a hot network machine. <laughs> You're going to have to now. I'm nope, going to have to, too. I don't have to, because I can keep them on the cold card, because the cold card talks to Bitcoin Core now. Woo! Yeah, this looks uh, promising. I'm glad to see it. Cold card development just doesn't stop. And in another random note, um, they have uh, removed some um, standard or derivation paths that are pretty much used by like nothing um, anymore. Although it will still allow signing for that if you have a wallet or you know anything set up that's using them right now. So, but Bitcoin Core. <laughs> Now, I saw this on Twitter, and I just got to say, good job, Raw Avocado. Man, talk about some pretty good entropy out there. And just a great thread on uh, on how you did it and everything. So, uh, why don't you run us through this? Yeah, so this is just a silly level of autism. Um, but, yeah, Raw uh buddy of ours went down a giant rabbit hole of um modeling entropy i guess you could say and wound up coming to the conclusion that one of the securest um sources of entropy is literally just you know the radiation of electrons from radioactive isotopes so he bought himself a raspberry pi a Geiger counter and an audio setup and literally broke out um, the element in a smoke detector that is radioactive and set everything up so that as that shot off electrons um, the Geiger counter would detect it and create audio which was logged as audio um, in the Raspberry Pi and pretty much just collected long strings of entropy from radiation and used this to generate um, some Bitcoin keys. So really um, like the only kind of caveat to this is thinking about the sensitivity of a Geiger counter and how that could potentially factor into limiting the entropy you're collection or collecting. But um, yeah, this is probably one of the most autistic ways I have ever seen anybody generate Bitcoin keys um, ever. So if you if you think that doing completely autistic things is, is fun, um, have at it. Uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't really argue with uh, radioactive isotopes as an entropy source. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say uh, good job, Raw. I, uh, I saw this thread and could hardly believe it. I was like, wow, 
all really like went down the rabbit hole here and um looks like you uh put together a good little guide for anybody else that wants to do something similar so that's funny good job you really put the polishing touches on that uh on that nerd house you built there raw it's neat (laughs) (laughs) now go play some guitar in the streets and record it all right though fud i guess I want to take us through the best effort at unraveling what the fuck happened with Kobo because uh, I stopped paying attention after I recommended people don't use it because of their weird, inconsistent documentation and strange uh, secure element they use supporting weird Chinese communist crypto curbs. Yeah. So I, I'm going to first off admit that I did not do a deep dive into why this is a story. So it's out there. Go find your own news, people. Uh, but the the point is that it is a story, which is to say that Kobo Vault uh, on September 15th will no longer have an official website. It won't have marketing materials. It won't have firmware upgrades. Uh, They're not even clear that existing firmware would remain available. Kind of sounds like after that, you have to email the customer service team. So if you have one of these products, I highly recommend you go download everything associated with your product now so you have it in the future if you intend to keep using this product. Uh, This this product, this Kobo Vault, was, uh, I think in its high end, it was a little bit under $500 for the device. It kind of looked like a, an Android cell phone. And uh, I, I think we had a bit of a discussion around some of the security on this thing at the time. And uh, it stood out uh, in its price, certainly, in that you could easily build a, a low-end laptop into a, a safe place to store your Bitcoin for similar amounts. And it was definitely the priciest thing on the market, I believe. It, it definitely had the most features, but it also kind of feels like a cell phone, which makes you wonder from a security front, right? But point being, these guys have unexisted this product. Um, I don't know what else to say. It, it must suck to be a company. Like these guys were out there selling a high-end product. They were probably going around to banks and whatnot and, and potential custodians. And they're like, look at this amazing thing. We have centralized security features. We can do this and that. And, you know, they just pull, they rug pull them. They straight up rug pull them on a very expensive device. Like this is the, the Apple product of the, the wallet market, or it was, I guess. Yeah, this like when you buy hardware in this space, you should think very hard about the reputability of the manufacturer and their reliability because, right? yeah, and like, you know, this is this is something that probably every single one of us on a long enough time horizon is going to have to deal with and consider and just, you know, plan around like. I love my cold card, but, you know, after a certain point, I'm betting people like Rodolfo are just going to get to a point of, fuck this, I don't care, I'm retired now. And all of us securing our coins with the cold card need to consider what's going to happen on that day and how we're going to deal with that. Like, you know, don't, like, there, there is a reason that key material is standardized in universal like formats that should be compatible with everything not built by a moron because nothing lasts forever and if they're not compatible check out walletsrecovery.org yep definitely think about it in your redundancy model uh, especially if you're doing things on devices that are centric to just that device and non-standard operations. And uh, this isn't necessarily saying you should never, ever, ever run Python code written by Wookiees, but it's good to have an idea of what's happening on your device and just a little education anyway. So if you're using something like a BIP 
39 seed, you have high faith that it will work similarly on multiple devices and can even test it. If you're doing something on your very specific device for some esoteric security reason, etc., you might want to consider having extra devices, say, on hand that are not currently used to be part of your model for dealing with this sort of thing. And the longer we go through time, the more relevant this problem can get. Yep. Plus, cold card V1s are the original NFT. <laughs> right. That and the Open Dime V1. Yep, stacking people. I got V2s, damn. Thing. Let's see. What's next? Bitfinex. Well, uh, Bitfinex is launching uh, Bitfinex Securities LTD, um, a regulated securities exchange, um, specifically looking at tokenized um, equities and such things. And um, yeah, it looks like the link in the news desk vanished, but um, Blockstream had tweeted out that uh, Bitcoin or Blockstream mining notes would be available at much smaller, um, you know, granular amounts than currently available on the platform. And I do believe I just saw an alert on my phone while we were recording that uh, Infinite Fleet, uh, Samson Mao's uh, game um, that his game company is building, um, was approved to offer a uh, regulated equities token, which I do believe will be trading on this platform as well. So, uh, yeah, here, here come the tokens, people. Boo. Choo choo. I want me some of them BMNs. Let's get them Americanized. Right. And micro. In the 1 100th, that sounds about perfect. Hey, Blackstream, call FTX. They'll put it on Ledger X. We're good. All right. More banking fun? Mm. So, the old Vast Bank who we talked about, I believe it's an Arizona area bank. Uh, we talked about in episode 258 um, are going around getting articles written about how they're going to be the first chartered bank to offer Bitcoin accounts alongside their traditional checking and savings accounts. And we talked about that back when they first were talking about how they were partnering with Coinbase, I believe, to do a, a back end on that. And they are back making noise that they have now shipped apps to the Apple and Google stores uh, that implement the functionality claimed. Um, it's out now. Get excited. And, uh, you know, I think arguably they are the first bank I've seen to do this under their own brand name. Uh, there's other projects where a traditional bank has kind of been the silent partner alongside a crypto exchange doing this uh, that doesn't have a banking license. Um, so this is fun. I think one thing to note here, uh, they're, they've got no minimums and no monthly fees. So positive on that. Uh, their trading fees are 1%, which is exactly why they're here. They're making a good spread on what Coinbase charges them, I hope. And uh, it's fun to see these products roll out from banks to normies because um, this type of thing will be a counterweight to the regulation uh, that we see with the coin bases of the world. Eventually, people would like to get some interest, please, in these apps, and the questions will be answered. And banks are... I'm really starting to think that banks are going to be Lightning's great existential crisis and a source of protocol development problems. Uh, expound on that. Once they integrate, you know, they're not going to want to start fucking with or upgrading that system quickly because uh, they have a lot of shit running on top of it. Well, that's not really a problem for bolts or whatever. I get why the banks wouldn't immediately step, like you're saying. But yeah. it also 
yeah, it, it's a totally different set of rails than what they run on right now. And I guess another interesting thing that will come once those rails are up is those are basically real time rails. And it'll be interesting to see if the non real time rails do go down in importance and in value transfer and all of that, or whether this is just a bolt on and it's, it's kind of like a, a new source. I think that'll probably be a touch and go thing playing around with, you know, where does it give them an edge? You know what I mean? Versus just stick with the normal procedure. Yep. So yeah, I guess uh, last thing up. This um, for a minute here, when I first saw this, I literally asked myself, "Did Marty Bent get replaced with a CIA android?" But um, he is joining the board of directors of Fortress Technologies, uh, which is pretty much an investment firm that looks at um, pushing ESG in industries that they invest in. And um, yeah, this is so entirely um, great American mining centric and likely in my opinion, a move to kind of get ahead of any bullshit related to gas flare mining in the sense of like, no, um, when you turn methane into carbon dioxide, you are actually helping reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, not making more of them. So uh, yeah, uh, interesting play uh, on Marty's hand and uh, wish him the best of luck here. Uh, I hope that he is able to kind of get ahead of stupid ass potential narrative shifts like that we have to have somebody out there putting the wedge into the published consciousness for use cases like electrical um conversion at, at gas sites that would have otherwise flare or that building out hydro capacity for later human use uh, could easily start by selling excess energy to Bitcoiners who would absolutely appreciate having renewable energy as their source that they could go talk about. There, there's lots of ways to talk about this and we definitely need people out there doing it. So uh, cheers to Marty. Uh, I'm sure it's great for business too. Yep. And I guess real quick before we move into final thoughts, like is not really didn't really have this proper on the news desk because there's not really that many sources beyond just a couple tweets here and there but um yeah yesterday um around the el salvador uh law going into effect with this whole stupid buy 30 dollars in solidarity meme um and the massive price crash uh, Bitfinex and a few other services uh, were claiming that they were being DDoS. And initially, I kind of thought that that might have just been ass covering in the sense of their systems got swarmed by a bunch of idiots all going to buy $30 of Bitcoin at the same time because of a stupid meme. But custodial lightning wallets um, have started getting DDoS as well. And um, yeah, let's just say this is gonna be, if this, if this really keeps up, if this continues, this is gonna be a big stress test for the lightning network um, because yeah, I'm not so sure how many node operators are really comprehensively thinking through network security, um, different types of network attacks that can be performed on their nodes or, you know, different pieces of infrastructure built up around it. And yeah, if we're going to start having, you know, countries using it as a payment rails, uh, all of that needs to get tightened down a little bit 
because you can't just have your financial rails randomly going offline when somebody throws a bunch of bots at it in a DDoS. Um, that needs to be a lot more hardened. Yeah, somebody see how those uh, packets map out to the IMF known subnets. I mean, dude, let's just say I... Uh, this was something I worried about uh, right after the announcement um, and had some discussions with some people about. Uh, but yeah, hopefully this is just a stupid transitory thing. But, uh, you know, eventually this might just become a thing that people running, you know, routing nodes and other infrastructure need to really think about comprehensively. Yep, and I believe when Strike was setting up, they made some commentary about getting some hardware out there on the ground. And ultimately, sometimes as an organization, you need your own stuff. So you know exactly what you can rely on or what to what degree you can rely on it. I'm so uh, sorry, we're still in the Lightning Network. Yeah, that's uh, great to see it operating with a country. Like, jeez. All right, but that is final thoughts time everybody my final thought is when it rains it pours man i don't know what happened at the end of this show like everybody just kept showing up at my house i missed like the second half of the show because i had to talk to like four different people man small town stuff is uh <laughs> it's no joke man people just show up they know like you're not answering your phone or something they're like hey we know where he lives we'll just go over there and ask him and so i've just been talking to people i'm sorry <laughs> the social network is real yeah my face speaking of facebook uh, apparently today uh, a court in australia ruled that facebook users are responsible for the content of messages in comments yeah i saw that holy crap like talk about they're really setting up the orwellian state down there down under can we go invade australia like I'm generally I mean, not on board with like the U.S. starting wars, but I think I'd make an exception for this one. I don't know how you're going to do that. Do you know how many kinds of weird creatures they have there? Yeah, we'll just shoot them. We we need yeah. to free the Australians. Plus, they're all on the coast. Like you know, we could just go over there with our navy. I mean, we've got still one of the biggest navies. It seems stupid, but for sure, I mean, like you know, this is all setting up for you know, bigger warfare and all that. They do too many more CBDC projects. We might go liberate them. <laughs> it's really sad though. I mean, like, have you guys seen the, uh, like videos from people with quarantine camp, like videos? And, and then I saw something where, you know, like, uh, you have to take a picture of yourself geolocated that like you're self quarantining and everything. Like, I mean, at a certain point it's like, Man, this is, uh, I, I mean, like, not at a certain point. It's already past the point of, like, this is so crazy. Like, uh, for sure, Australia has changed in such a way that I'm sure the people there would say uh, you can't recognize it from the country it was five years ago. Like, it's night and day. If I lived in Australia, I would be in prison by now. You know, yeah. and this is where I got, I got to say a final thought. If you're in America, if you're in the U.S., and uh, you even, you know, got family that's cousins or something that's in school. You got to go to these school board meetings and shut this shit down where they're trying to enforce kids to do, uh, you know, COVID measures where it's just it's absolutely absurd. I mean, and there and I said it to her now, it's, you know, censored or wherever on YouTube. But F it, man, like if you're in the if you're in the United States and you're thinking about, you know, should I go to that school board meeting? Go to it. Go to the school board meeting and voice your opinion because these people need to have pushback. They've got, they've got to. If you're in the United States, that's your your duty. If you're if you understand this shit, you got to go push back on this shit because look what happened in Australia. Let them take over your schools, whatever. Then they're gonna come right after you, man. This isn't a joke anymore. Go shut this shit down. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, s- same for the rest of it. The school board is an excellent venue, and uh, really any civic venue is a good spot to be in and be talking at this point. Um, you know, a lot of stuff is getting shaped and contextualized in weird ways right now, and it it could use some some help and some sanity from all of us, uh, maybe to wind some stuff back. Right on. Yep. Man, well, before uh, El Salvador got all that free Bitcoin money from Sailor, who I know dumped the market just to get them in cheap, um, happened, you know, it was, it was feeling pretty bullish around here, boys and girls. Like, it was, uh, it was feeling like the double cycle was, was the double cycle. So uh, I just want to remind everybody, I know you're all rich on NFTs, you know, punch drunk on your your various winnings. You know, hopefully, hopefully the world you want will come to pass. So uh, hold on to your hats, you know, try to stay sane. Buy the dip. All right, Janine, what else you got for us? Uh, well, a couple of days ago, Sci-Hub turned 10 years old. If you don't know what Sci-Hub is, it's a place where you can get a bunch of academic articles without having to deal with paywalls or just databases that are extremely hard to search for academic research. Because you can put a bunch of different identifiers in there, like the title of the article or the DOI number, lots of things, and it is just so user-friendly. Um, and got removed from Twitter a bit, dealing with legal cases in different countries, but they're still going, and apparently for the 10-year anniversary, she um, actually added 2 million more <laughs> articles to the uh, the archive. Um, and also, SciHub takes Bitcoin, because it's the only way they can get money, <laughs> is with Bitcoin. SciHub is su- super cool, natural Bitcoin use case. Uh, any freaks out there who haven't read about it, uh, there are some good little write-ups on its history that don't take too long. It's, uh, it's one of those Bitcoin success stories. It's one of those information wants to be free success stories. Yep. Like, say what you want about like anything done privately and people's right to charge or keep you know that private. But uh, yeah, when you're talking about publicly funded scientific research, go fuck yourself with that argument. Yeah, it's completely ridiculous. Our current state of society gets you know so much funding from the government, but it's not necessarily public in its results. And one of the examples are all of these guys getting masters and PhDs and whatever else writing about stuff that a lot of people and a lot of companies would happily use the results of or just read for interest if it were publicly available. And the irony is it's funded with public money, you know, and it gets called. Oh, it could be a public good and sadly it's not being used as a public good but we should push for this we are in the age of open source and i think this will ultimately open source and you know people like sci-hub are making sure those who would like to use it that way can you're here and my other final thought is that i have once again published my monthly newsletter it is out for the month of august there's i think eight stories in there um mostly dominated by the infrastructure bill yeah so there you go i need to go read that because i haven't been keeping up with it but i'm sure we're all screwed from it oh if you guys haven't caught it i think the new big bill is officially something along the lines of the build back better plan (laughs) great they they full went with it Davos sent them the copy, and they stamped it right on there. It's good stuff, I'm sure. I think I feel something coming up in my throat. I'm just... Yeah. Well, I guess uh, nobody else has anything else. I'm going to end on a Robert Heinlein quote. The best things in history are accomplished by people who get tired of being shoved around. Don't forget that. Catch you later, punks. Later, everyone. Cheers.
Yeah, I'm gonna have to wait for you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to wait for you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to wait for you.